pages of an old family Bible. I found eight of verse this and an older Bible. Then I came up on a page. It was written by a female hand. I said, this is my last request. And these are my single plans. I said, when I die, let me die speaking in tongues. Let it ring in my ears. All of these
We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison door. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. He won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Oh, we sing to the God who leads. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who works. And he rose up out of that grave My God is still rolling stones away There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet We shout out of your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet we shout out of your praise. Shout out your praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing free. I'll sing, we were the beggars. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing His praise. Come on. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out. the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We were forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, Let the house of the Lord sing free. Sing it with us, church. Here we go. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. we do today, Lord. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my 
my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Till I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God. Now sing it. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest nights you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will see of the good sing it this morning without any music, okay? Here we go. All my life you have been faithful. Oh. Hasn't he though? Yes, he has. And no. all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able. Of the goodness of God, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, He's so good to us. I will sing of the goodness of God. We are such a blessed people today. God is so good to us. Oh, amazing grace, oh, 
how sweet the sound that saved a wretch oh, like me. Oh, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now oh, I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to feel, and grace. that part where he said he saved a wretch like me amen thank you praise team what an awesome job this morning children you may be dismissed to go to your classes also Courtney is going back to the nursery so if you their nursery will be available if you need to use the nursery this morning she is back there 
And the nursery is right out this door, back door right here to your right. It's where the nursery's at if you need it this morning. Before Loretta runs off, and I'd like to have, I'd like to have James to come up here as well. This is two of the staples of our church. I've been their pastor, I don't know how long I was their pastor while that I was at Possible Assembly of God, and, and uh, they have just been friends of mine for many, many years, and uh, they have been such a blessing to me, and Loretta's still just as crazy as she ever was. Thank you. She's just as sweet as she can be, and she's in charge of this family. She's in charge. And uh, just like it is at my house. Uh, but they have made quite an accomplishment. They have already read the Bible through this year. And they are going to be already started reading it again through now. So we want to honor them with this certificate that they have read the Bible through. Congratulations, James and Loretta for this accomplishment, and uh, you may get it finished again before the year's over, just according to how much time we spend, isn't it? <laughs> hey, I'm getting close to getting my certificate, okay? okay. Uh, thank you guys very much. So uh, when some of the rest of you get your scriptures read through for the year, let me know, and uh, we will be honoring you as well. I told you I would do that if you do it by audio or however you do it. It will be perfectly fine. We want to award you for reading the Bible through. Because, you know, the only way we know the Word is to put the Word in us. Because a lot of times this Word that we have heard years and years and years, it didn't turn out to be that way, really, when we heard it so many times. And matter of fact, I just had someone to just ask me last night, call me and ask me a question. Over in the, it was in the Old Testament, which the Old Testament is still vital, but it was one of the old laws, and they was asking about that old law, whether there are 613 of them, and if you failed in one of them, you failed in all of them. Hey, that would have been quite of an accomplishment if you could have lived all that, but it was impossible to do that. Well, once a year, they had to go and to the high priest, and the high priest had to forgive their sins for another year. But thank God there was a man called Jesus Christ who came on the scene that no longer do we have to have the sacrifice of bulls and goats, but we had the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and today he lives forevermore. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles and know where that we read from last week, we'll be going to the same place this week. I, I think my grandson is correct in many different ways. He says, Pow, Paul, you can make a series out of grace. So uh, that when I started on this sermon, I never intended for it to be a, I never intended, hello, buddy. I never intended for it to be a series. But I just told those in the sound booth this morning, it kind of looks like it's heading that way. So um, next, probably the next couple of weeks, we'll be talking about this same subject. This is a subject that is very controversial nowadays. But it's a subject that needs to be touched on. So, you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 1, verses 8 through 38 is where, 18 through 38 is where I will be going after a while. But I'm not going to ask you to stand because it's going to be a while before that I get there. I've got some things that I want to talk about first. And the subject that we're going to be trying to navigate through today, as I told you last week, I titled my message, Agenda in America. Well, what is the agenda that we're talking about? Sex, sexuality, and the way that it has been distorted. You tell me that is not a controversial subject in today's time. And the reason I chose this subject to talk about it is because there is not a family in America that is not dealing with this particular subject somewhere in their life whether it be through a friendship, whether it be in your immediate family, people are struggling today with their identity. They're struggling with same-sex attractions, 
Some are non-binary. I'll never forget the first time I ever heard that word. Of all places, I was in Branson, Missouri when that I heard about it. And I had went up there to meet with my aunt. And we were gathered at their condo, and she was telling me about her nephew. And she said, he is non-binary. And I said, what in the world is non-binary? I had never heard of that. Probably some of you haven't heard of that either, so I'm going to tell you what it is. It is those that are, I guess you could say it, gender non-conforming. These are the people that one day they are a male, one day they're a female, and the next day they're confused like they were the two present days before that. So that is who binary, non-binary people are. Some people suffer from gender dysphoria. Many different kinds of sexual disorders they are trying to identify with today. And you and I, the church, are trying to figure out a way that we deal with this. We are trying to figure out what that we can say. The church has been doing one thing, I think, wrong for many years. We have been screaming at the darkness. Screaming and yelling at the darkness. We have been going about it the wrong way. No, I'm not saying that we need to lower our expectations of what that the Scripture says. I'm not saying that we need to move away from the Bible. We need to hold true to what the Bible says. But the way sometimes that we say things definitely does make a difference. And I used this last week. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says, But your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense for anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, with gentleness and kindness. In other words, he's saying, when someone asks you a question about your faith, always be ready to answer them. And he tells us to answer them when they ask you about this. Turn my monitors down. They're trying to squeal. When they ask you about this, to answer it with gentleness and respect. But sometimes we have a problem with using gentleness and respect. Why? Because sometimes, and I believe that we are biblical, biblically correct when that we say this, I believe that we are speaking the truth, but if your delivery, when that you deliver it, does not show grace, and it does not show gentleness, and it does not show respect, we are closing a door for opportunity. Now, you need to think about that for just a moment. When we shut people out, we are closing a door for opportunity. Well, we say, how? Do we deliver this message to the world? And why would the enemy want to attack in this area? Quickly, let's go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, where it said that God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Then let's go to verse 27, where it said, so God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So, I told you last week, Scripture and science will prove the same thing, that there are only two genders. No matter how many genders that we try to come up with, there are only two. But it takes, now listen very closely to this, it takes male and female to comprise the image of God. How does that happen? Did you know that when a union of a man and a woman comes together, it forms the Trinity. You have man, you have woman, and when they come together and they conceive, there's creation. It's a child is being born. How does that fulfill the Scripture? Because the Word of God told, tells us that it procreation what is what that God intended to happen. God intended man to create, to procreate. He intended for man 
to multiply. So God created them, male and female, in his image and in his likeness. And God creates the confines of marriage. This is why that the enemy comes after this very thing. For it said here that man said, this is Adam, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, for she is taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his wife, leaves his father and his mother, and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Marriage is between a male and a female, and that is the reason that the enemy today is coming against that. It's God's, it's God's likeness. It's God's image. And the enemy doesn't like it. Why does he come after it? Because this is the first institution God created. And this institution was something that we call marriage. Of one man and one woman together. They become together creating one life. And that was God's original purpose. So Satan comes to distort the image that God created. And that is why that there is such an onslaught of that in America and across the world today. Because of that. Let's hurry through this. I told you last week that a sexual sin is unique. It's different than all the other sins. Yes, all of them are sins. The Bible lets us know. That there we all fall short. We all sin. But sexual sin is a different sin. A sexual sin is unique in the reason being in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, it tells us to run from sexual sin. Listen to these words. It says, No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. Why would he say that? I'm going to tell you more down in, the, in my message this morning. I don't want to spend too much time here. Why? Because this sin affects the body because it affects the mind. How does it affect the mind? Let's just take pornography, for instance. Once you see a little bit of it, the mind will not stop until it sees some more. And you will just want to keep getting it worse and more aggressive and more vulgar. And let me tell you something here today. Pornography has, ran, has caused so many problems in marriages. Now, those people are actors. They're getting paid to carry out all of that emotion. And if you get hooked on pornography and the way so many couples look at it, I've dealt with this in counseling before, because if they don't act like they do in pornography, they are not performing like that they should. And what it does, they go from this to something worse. Then they go into child pornography. Then they go into bestiality. They just keep getting deeper and deeper. Why? Because the enemy, he controls your mind. And he wants to take you into the depths of sin as far as he can take you. For sexual sin, it's immortal. It's immo uh, immoral. Immoral. And it's a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and who lives inside of you is God? Then it's gone down. Let's go down to Timothy. I'm going to skip some here. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and for the rebels and for the ungodly and the sinful, the unholy, the irreligious, for those who kill their fathers and their mothers, for murders and for sexual immoral. What is sexual Immorality. Sexual immorality is any type of sex that is outside the confines of marriage between one man and one woman. I'm going to go through this again. But I'm about to get into what I wanted to talk about today. If you're sleeping with your boyfriend, is that sexual immorality? The answer is yes. 
If you're having an affair with someone that is not your spouse, is that sexual immorality? The answer is yes. If you're sleeping with another man, a man sleeping with another man, is that sexual immorality? Yes, it is. If you're a woman sleeping with another woman, is that sexual immorality? Yes, it is. The Bible makes that very, very clear. So now we get down to Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 through 38. For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against the ungodliness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. For all they, though they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking, the mind. Is that what I said a while ago? The mind, their thinking became futile. What does that word mean? It means incapable of producing any useful results. In other words, their thinking became pointless. Whatever they were thinking didn't make any sense. Does that sound like today? Crazy. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Listen. Although they claimed to be wise... They became fools and exchanged the glory of an immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. And therefore God gave them over. I want you to pay attention to those words right there. God gave them over. It means that God completely abandoned them. I believe that we are living in a society today with some of the people's thinking of America and across the world today that God has completely abandoned them because it has become total darkness. He says he completely abandoned them in in the sinful desires of their hearts in sexual impurity for the degrading. Number one, I have that highlighted for you. For the degrading of their bodies with one another. In other words, they totally brought dishonor to themselves. They were brought suffering and they brought shame upon themselves because of what that they were doing with each other. And they exchanged the truth. I said they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. How many people today, when that they look at themselves, they know down deep inside that they are not living the truth. They know that they are living a lie. But I pray, oh God, send a revival in the United States of America and across the world to where that the truth will be revealed to them and these people will turn themselves back to God and let God change their total being. It is possible. Let's go move on down to verse 26. Because of this, God gave them over. There's that word again. He mentions it three times in these verses. He totally abandoned them. He completely abandoned them to shameful lust. The King James Version there says, vile affections, which this also means dishonor, reproach, and shame. Even their women exchange natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed. Inflamed. Let me stop right there. If I forget where I'm at, somebody tell me. I have a a good friend that's a doctor. I ran on to him one day at the hospice center before they closed it. And he was going to a particular church here in town. And he was telling me, he said, Pastor, I had to get out of there. 
because the people there, nearly every one of them were totally flaming homosexuals. Well, what does the Bible tell us to do about that? It says to flee. To flee. Furthermore, just as they did not think it was worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over. He completely abandoned them to a deprived mind or a reprobate mind, which was their mind became worthless. So that they did what not ought to be done, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossipers, slanders, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. And the next six words. And they invent ways to do evil. Some of, the, some of the things I hear nowadays, I say, who in the world would have ever thought of that? Who would have ever thought of furries? Kids in school needing a litter box in the hallway. I have a friend of mine that lives across the waters, and I'm not talking about Israel either. I'm talking about Yale County, who was a superintendent or a principal over there at one time. And he had to deal with this. And he was telling me about one of the kids that went home and he told his parents that today... They chose to be a cat. What a shock. Now what would you do if your kid, you, your kid told you they decided to be a cat? I know what my dad would have done, but I couldn't do that. So here's what these parents did. When it come time to set the table that night, they put their food in a cat bowl down by the wall. When they got ready to go to bed that night, they put them a, a pallet down on the, in the floor. And then when it come time for them to go to the restroom, they put them a box outside. And the child said, What's this all about? They said, well, you said you wanted to be a cat. We were just helping you out. This is inventing ways. We are living in the very day that the writer of the book of Romans is talking about. These verses of Scripture, let me, before I get all wound up and going down here, it said they disobeyed their parents. They have no understanding, no uh, fidelity, no love. No mercy, all they know, although they know God's righteous degree, that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Practice them. In other words, they give them a pat on the back. These verses of Scripture. Paul, writing the book of Romans, was written 1968 to 1969 years ago, but still yet, it sounds like today. Have you noticed the downward spiral in our country? I'm sure that you have. This is a demonic agenda. I, let me say it again. It is a demonic agenda. And this demonic agenda, she's already ahead of me. She can't wait. 
<laughs> or is that Zach? He can't wait because he already saw what the topic is. This de demonic agenda has infiltrated and invaded our politics. You say, Pastor, you're not going to go there, are you? Just wait and see. Because what I'm talking about today is not a political issue. What I'm talking about today is a biblical issue. And what has happened, politicians has hijacked biblical issues and they are trying to make them uncomfortable to us who are clergy and trying to keep us from speaking about it because we say we can't mix politics and religion. That is one of the most foolish things I have ever heard in my life. How in the world can you keep from mixing politics and religion? If you are a child of God today and you go to the polls and you vote for some of these people that for are, are so ungodly and you know who they are, I question your Christianity. Right. What has happened is so many people from the pulpit have got silent on these basic fundamental issues such as gender and marriage that they are afraid to speak out. I just listen. I listen to preachers all the time. Ask my wife. She'll say, I'm trying to watch TV. <laughs> That's just part of it. But I'm going to get my earbuds hooked up. That way it won't bother. But I was watching a black preacher this week. And in 2020, he talked about this same issue in his church. He pastors a huge church. His name is Bishop Woodson. If you would like to Google him, Google's a good thing. Use it. Or go to uh, YouTube and Google or put in his name, Bishop Wood Woodson. In 2020, he brought up the issue when that our present president, Joe Biden, and Kamala Harris were running for president. And he made the statement that he did not think that their policies were good for the black community. And he went in to tell why that he didn't believe that they were good. One reason being is because 70%, well, abortion was one of them, and he said it was not good for the black community because 70% of the ladies that received abortions were black people. So, that was one of the issues that he had a problem with and he told his congregation about it. And another one was the same-sex issue that he thought it was bad for the community. Because, now this is his words, not mine. He said, there's already talk across the nation about how confusing it is for the black child on Father's Day. So he said, it wouldn't be good for the community and having men living with men and women looking with, living with women. Here's what happened later. You think, if you think that our government doesn't listen to what that we are saying, you're on their side. Because a little short time after he said this, three IRS agents come knocking 
on his door. He had to hire an attorney. And he said, I have got a streak in me. <laughs> that when I know I'm right and they come against me, I'm going to let them know it. But he went through it. And they asked him, said, what's wrong with what I said? You know I was right in what I said. But here's what the agents told him. You may be right, but you can't say it. See, what policy, politics has done is tried to silence. They threaten. Not only do they threaten, but they put pressure. Let me hurry. I'm not gonna, my wife's going to leave out of here before I get ready for her to. Honey, you just stay set until I tell you to leave. Okay. <laughs> I want to take you down memory, memory lane here for just a moment. On some of these issues. On September the 21st, 1996, President Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton, a man, probably the last president from what that I've been able to search out, that was able to balance the budget. I didn't say that he did away with the the national debt. Matter of fact, the national debt, the closest it has ever been to being totally wiped out was back in 18 and 36. But I, by, I, I believe, Andrew Jackson. So we're talking about a man that balanced the budget, and the reason he was able to do that is because he cut defense spending and there was a good GDP while that he was in there. But I brought his name up because of this. It was President Bill Clinton in 1996 that passed the Mar Defense of Marriage Act. It was a law that defined marriage between one man and one woman. Then, in 2007 and 2008. Some of you remember, we were in quite, I don't know whether you could call it a recession or depression, but whatever it was, it found me without a job. We had very little to do, and because of God's favor on my life, and a friend of mine, when I told him I didn't have anything to do, he told me, he said, I will see what I can do about that. And David Keener, a guy that I went to school with, kept Randy and I busy until the day that he died. It was because of the crashing of the housing market that the, that, that the economy crashed. It was time to elect a new president, and at that time, Barack Obama and Joe Biden campaigned on the Democratic side of, th side of things, and John McCain and Sarah Palin campaigned on the Republican side. And at that time, listen close, I've got it marked in my notes here. At that time, Barack Obama and Joe Biden defined marriage as being between one man and one woman. At that time, most of the Americans believe that marriage should be between one man and one woman. So they, when they campaigned on this in 2007 and 2008, in 2008, Obama won the White House. They sought re-election in 2012 and was re-elected, and everything changed in 2012 and ever since 2012 it has been going at a fast rate of speed accelerated downhill who remembers what happened at the White House in 2012 the White House 
was lit up like a rainbow. There it is. And this rainbow wasn't the, the rainbow that God said that he would let us remember that there would never be a flood again by. Let's move on. Then in 2006, 2015, the United States Supreme Court struck down all bans on same-sex marriage, legalized and required 50, all 50 states to honor out-of-state same-sex marriage. Eight years later, on the White House lawn of the White House, on June the 10th, 2013, President Biden speaking at a Pride Month celebration, had the White House a pride flag flying between the two American flags which completely breaks protocol. Protocol is that there should be no flag fly above the American flag or in the center of the American flag. What do you see? In my opinion, for what it was worth, and I believe that I'm right on, this is telling the American people, this is that movement, this demon, demonic movement is telling us that we have conquered you. We are seeing an acceleration in our culture and it's getting faster and faster, quicker and quicker. And we've gone from one man and a mar woman being married in 1996 to where that things are today. Listen to this. According to the LGBTQ Victory Institute, as of April 29th, 2021, 100, and, 100 days in Joe Biden's presidency, over 200 well-known LBGTQ people have been appointed in this administration, the most in history of any administration. Who would have ever thought that in the United States of America, people seeking the highest office of our land would be the ones, partially the ones, that would put tampons in a boy's restroom. How freaky does that get? Who would have ever thought that abortion, we would have people that would be for abortion plumb up to the moment of birth. When that we had a preacher right here in our congregation just a few months ago by the name of Randy Caldwell had a granddaughter born in, into, the, in, into their family. And I believe that this child was 21 or 24 months old. And nobody thought that it could live. But did you know today that child is breathing on its own? Why? Because the hand of God was on it. Don't tell me that that child is not alive. I don't know about you, but I get unrighteous or righteous indignation when that I start hearing all of this. That they think that abortion should be legal plumb up to the point of pregnancy. And then, on top of that, they stand for mutilation of a child that can't buy a pack of cigarettes, that can't drive a car, They will stand for a child to have his body or her body mutilated. You tell me that's not demonic. You tell me it's not demonic. You prove me wrong. Because when stuff like this happens, we are born male and female. And here's what, let's go a little bit further. This same group of people 
And ever nobody, everybody knows who I'm talking about. But I want to tell you something. These people today is not riding the same donkey that they was years ago. It's a, it's, this, this donkey has done crossed the fence. It's done, it's done become a hybrid of its own. On top of that, they are totally against a child going for counseling to try to talk him or her to what we would call in the common sense. See, when these children see when that there's magazines in some of our libraries that they can go in and there's books there that they can open up and they can read about us look at and it's in their age group and they see all of these things it makes them start questioning their identity and the sad thing is we have got so many parents that have stopped being the parent anymore and they are letting the child lead the parent. It's time for parents and grandparents, some of you sitting here today, that you start taking time with your kids and your grandkids and telling them what the truth is because somebody is going to tell them something and the things that they are shooting our kids nowadays are nothing but demonic lies. I know I'm preaching to the choir this morning. It's easy to get you to say amen to me. But if you don't take this outside these doors, what good does it do you? What good does it do you? Who would ever thought that we would see these demonic agendas that is not only infiltrated and invaded our politics, but our corporate America as well. What do you mean, Pastor? April the 1st, 2023. Who ever heard of Dylan Mac Mulvaney? Who ever heard of Dylan Mulvaney? There it is. Who was transitioning to, into a woman who teamed up with Anheuser Bush? the parent company of Bud Light. And Bud Light took over a billion dollar hit for this. However, they don't care. And I'm going to tell you why in just a moment. In May of 2023, Target par partnered with a guy by the name of Eric Carnell. Eric Carnell is a transgender designer whose products a lot of times reference to Satan, and he is a Satan worshiper himself. And I want you to look at his logo in the corner. It should be right here. Satan respects pronouns. Does that tell you anything? Satan respects pronouns. Does that tell me something that Satan, these demonic agenda, this demonic power is not getting hold of some of our people? When that they want you to proclaim that you call them by their pronoun? It got so bad in Target that they had to remove these items because of the threats on their team members and the safety and the well-being of their workers. And to settle it all down and to get rid of the backlash, they had, the backlash, they had to take his, these items out of their store. North Face, a very popular brand, has a new spokesperson who is a transgender for their product who is becoming a woman. Why 
would these companies be pushing this so strongly? Target lost $10 billion in 10 days. And before the boycott was over, they lost $12 billion. However, I'm going to tell you that they don't really care. Here's where you're going to call me a conspiracy theorist. But you've proved me wrong. All of this info that I have is on Google. You look it up. Don't look at one page. You better look at a bunch of them. Look at them. Here's why they don't care. It's something called CEI. What is CEI? It's Corporate Equality Index. Remember that name. What does Corporate Equality Index stand for? It is a national benchmarking tool on corporate policy, policies, and benefits pertinent to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer employees. And every U.S. corporation is graded. We never did like those in school. Every corporation is graded on diversity, equity, and inclusion. See, DEI all started in the mid-1960s as a civil rights movement. And then it was hijacked by activist groups who become more and more inclusive to shape their different identities. And these companies, even though they are losing more money short term, they are considering the short term loss for the long term gain, what they call victory. The thing about it is, they are not targeting people my age. They are not targeting people Tim's age. They are not targeting people Tyler's age. But they are targeting our children. The reason they don't care is because every single U.S. corporation has a larger investor. And a lot of these corporations are invested or backed by an investor called BlackRock. How many of you ever heard of BlackRock? BlackRock is behind CEI, DEI, and BlackRock has trillions of dollars of investments in U.S. corporations. The reason I put trillions of dollars in this is because when I was researching this out, one said they have $12 trillion in investments, and another one went up as high as $85 trillion. Now, I didn't take the time to figure this out. To do the math on it. But a hundred dollar bill is two thousandths of an inch thick. Five of them would be ten thousandths. Fifty of them would be a hundred thousandths. A thousand of them would be one inch. Is my math correct? Anybody out there adding with me? A thousand one hundred dollars 
bills would be one inch tall. How many inches is it to the moon? How many times to and back could you stack $100 bills with $85 trillion? I'm going to try to figure that out the next week. What I'm trying to sell, tell you, the reason that these companies does not care is because really, in the long run, it's not going to change a thing because they got these big investors behind them funding them, and these companies that's funding them have a lot more money than you and I do. Let's hurry. I've got to hurry because I'm going to get through these before I quit. This demonic agenda has not only infiltrated, invaded politics and corporate America, but it has also invaded the homes of celebrities. Matter of fact, a lot of this starts in homes of celebrities. Just a couple. Megan Fox has three sons. One for sure is going through transitioning to be a girl. And possibly the other two. Dwayne Wade, an NBA basketball player for the Miami Heat. His son is transitioning to be a girl. Why would these young children Be so enticed by this. Another reason. China. One of the backers of TikTok. All of these things that I am speaking of are being pushed on TikTok, Snapchat, different social media. 24 hours a day. You say, well, Pastor, what do you expect me to do about all that? I want to ask you, how many of you hand your phone to a child when that they're barely getting up old enough to play with it? There's nothing wrong with that. But you are teaching them at that very moment to explore. My little old grandson likes to play, a great-grandson, two years old. They hand him a computer, uh, hand him the phone, and he'll just start going to it until he gets to the game that he wants to play. Did you know that there are games on phones that these kids do not need to be playing? Did you know that they can take, if you give them your phone or you give them a, a, a device, an action device, and they have the privacy of it in their bedroom or in the privacy of it in the bathroom, did you know that they can go on there and Google porn? They can look for anything their heart desires. And we wonder why our kids are getting so jacked up. I'm not getting there. Nowhere there. Last Friday night, what is America's team sport? If Gene Brewer was here, he'd tell me. Baseball. It's America's favorite pastime. Last year, at a Friday night home game, the Los Angeles Dodgers honored a group called Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. This group is a group of drag queens, and they put a performance on. Listen to this now. And some of you are saying, well, preacher, why are you showing these demonic things in church even? Because if I had to view it, I'd never known it. All I'm doing is bringing the truth to you of what's out there. This group of drag queens put on a performance of Jesus hanging on the cross and giving Jesus a lap dance. And here's, here's the kicker to the whole thing. After 
this presentation, I guess you would call it, they awarded them the Community Hero Award. You tell me this is not demonic. Putting that, how many children was at that baseball game? You say, well, Pastor, this is not very encouraging. It's not meant to be. It's meant to open your eyes. It's because I want you to see the world that we live in. And here's the last one. And some of you, I know you want to say amen, but please don't. The demonic agenda has not only infiltrated and invaded our politics, our corporate, corporate American homes of celebrities, but it also has infiltrated the church. These churches are called affirming churches. Churches, how would they get that name? Affirming church. An affirming church do not consider homosexuality or transgender identity to be a sin. And they fly the flag outside of their church. Well, pastor, what do you say about churches like this? I have enough to run my own. But what does the Bible say about this? I'm going to put it straight to you. These churches have apostatized. What is apostasy? I'm going to break it down to you. Apostasy, apostasy is this, a departure of the faith. Apostasy is abandoning the faith. And it is totally falling away from the faith. But again, I say, they are not targeting us because we know better. We have people sitting right here in our church this morning that has ran from affirming churches. Why? Because they knew what the Word of God said. I pray, O oh Lord, send a revival in every church in America and let us fall upon our knees and turn from our wicked ways and cry out unto Him and repent. And when we do, we will see a revival in the land. Why? See, everything that I have shown you here this morning and the time that it took me to show it, if you summarize it, you would summarize it by saying this is insanity, madness. But what does the Bible call it? The Bible calls it depravity. As I look at our nation, we see a nation that screams and hollers and yells and gathers in huge groups and marches our streets to embrace depravity. Deception has come in the truth and the standard of the truth and demonic strongholds has formed in this country. Mom, Dad, Grandpa and Grandma hear me out. We are going to have to fight for our children Because if we don't fight for them, who is going to fight for them? I have in my drawer, I don't need it anymore. It used to be laying on my nightstand. And every night when I crawl in that bed, regardless of what time it is, I start out at the top of my list. 
I call my oldest son's name. I call his wife's name. I call my oldest granddaughter's name, her husband's name. And then after that, I call my little two-year-old great-grandchild's name, Ridge, in prayer every night. Then I call Brandy, I call Shane, I call Braden's name. I call my Meredith's neighbor, Jeff Powell's name. I call Donald Tillman's name. I call Bill Tillman's name. I call Kenny Collins' name. I call Mike Collins' name. Why? Because this nation needs revival in it. And the only way is when we get sincere enough and we fall upon our knees and take that before God. That's the only way that our nation is going to ever change. Why do we need to fight for our children? Because it's your children. They are still moldable and impressionable. And you've got to fight for them. In closing... This is my final statement. Why do you need to fight for your children? The reason being, suicide is the second leading cause of death among our young people aged 10 to 14. And the third leading cause of death among 15 to 25 year olds, according to the Center of Disease and Control Prevention. This is among... Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning young people who are significantly increasing the risk. LGBTQ plus people are more than four times as likely to attempt suicide as their peers more than 1.8 million LGBTQ plus young people ages 13 to 24 seriously consider suicide each year in the United States of America. And at least one attempts su attempt suicide every 45 seconds. The Trevor Project's 2023 U.S. National Survey on mental health of LGBTQ young people found that 41% of LGBTQ young people seriously considered attempting suicide in the past year, including roughly half of, gen of transgender and non-binary youth what I'm saying is parents and grandparents you can't keep your kids out of this world but you can do your best to keep the world out of them this morning we've got to prepare our kids Prepare our kids who are entering into this world, out going out. And you've got to be the, the light in the midst of their darkness. What does the scripture say that the church is? If you're a child of God today, you should be the light. If, you're not light, if your light is not shining as brightly as it should, it could be because you're not spending enough time with Him. For me and my house, we're going to serve.